Um, so my name is Darren. I'm the Environmental Program Programs Officer at Massive Ranger Shire Council, and I'm joined by Patricia or Pat Danko from um, Deep Creek Landcare, and um, Tanya Lu is the Biodiversity Officer at Council. Um, I would like to start by um, acknowledging. Um, the, the, Mas the Macedon Ranger Shire Council is located in the lands and waterways of the Jajarung, Tangarung and Wurundjeri Woiwurrung peoples, who are the traditional owners and custodians of this land and waterways. I recognise their living cultures and ongoing connection to country and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging, and any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. I would also like to acknowledge that I'm uh, joining you from the Wurundjeri country, um, the land of the Wurundjeri Wurrung peoples. Um, let's let a couple more people in. Um, so we're lucky in Macedon Rangers. We um, we have a really rich um, biodiverse area with lots of different parks and gardens and um, areas of support habitat for wildlife and um, plants. Um, Tanya, you might have been out of the room, but I just want to introduce Tanya. Is going to be leading the, a large part of this um, presentation tonight. So Tanya is the biodiversity officer at council, um, and we've Gardens for Wildlife was started by Knox City Council um, or in Knox City Council that set up a model um, with Gardens for Wildlife Victoria, and it's really important that we acknowledge them and the work that they've done in supporting councils like Macedon Rangers to develop a program that supports community and improving biodiversity and habitat and gardens for wildlife across Victoria. Um, this program, so Gardens for Wildlife, it's, it fits in with um, council strategic direction. So in our environment strategy, we, we have um, a role to um, ensure community engagement and involves partnerships, which um, through development of biodiversity programs, um, take action to mitigate and adapt to climate change and enhance biodiversity on public and private land. Um, and we've also flagged that the biodiversity, Gardens for Wildlife fits really well into our biodiversity strategy and um, helps, it provides a model for improving biodiversity on private land, in, particularly in residential and urban space. Um, so thanks for joining and thanks um, to Pat for taking her time to, to join as well. So after, after um, Tanya speaks, Pat will also be speaking about the work that they've done around Lancefield in um, starting and kind of, and being really um, instrumental in driving some of the initiatives that Gardens for Wildlife has already happened in the Macedon Ranges. Um, so I'll hand it over to Tanya. Um, who is going to, I guess, talk about what you can do and um, if we could just make sure you're um, on mute. Um, um, yeah, just double check you're all on mute and um, I'll hand it over to Tanya and Tanya will be doing a presentation for about 20 to 30 minutes. So I'll stop sharing my screen. There was a little question, a question in the chat, what time we reckon we're going to finish up. Yeah, uh, okay, good, good. Yeah, so we've um, scheduled about an hour for presentations and discussion and um, a bit of time for Q&A. So we will be finished before 7.30. So um, it's scheduled to go roughly an hour, but allow time for any questions and discussion. So, and this will, as I mentioned, this will be recorded. So um, we'll send this out to everyone and I'll, with a bit more information to... Yep, and feel free to ask questions in the chat. I'll be keeping an eye on that. Thanks. Cool. Um, so can, can everyone see the correct screen here so that you're just seeing um, the, the, the first screen of my presentation? Yep. Yep, great. Okay. Uh, yep, great. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Darren, for that introduction. And um, yeah, I'm delighted. I'm looking forward to Pat's talk as well. So that's, uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to hearing how the setup of that program is going along. So uh, as Darren said, I'm the Biodiversity Projects Officer at Macedon Rangers Shire Council. Um, I have a long background in 
mainly fauna advice, but also in uh, yeah wildlife friendly gardening and improving your property for fauna um, and habitat in general. And um, I've been giving a few presentations based on that knowledge uh, before I got the job at uh, Macedon uh, for the Hepburn Gardens for Wildlife program, for, uh, which was set up uh, at the Hepburn Shire a couple of years ago. Um, because this is a bit of a, a beginning and a taster, uh, it's very much an introduction and uh, I could talk for ages. Um, so it's just a little dip in. Um, so without further ado, oh, I also would like to say that I am speaking from Jaja Warang country. And I'd like to say, even though I can't see you, I'm really happy for people to interrupt by, you know, just giving a shout out, just go Tanya, and I'm happy to answer questions. Um, um, and yeah, let's go. Right. So with this talk, what I'm going to do is talk about creating habitat and the different elements that you need to create habitat. And then I'm going to look, talk a little bit about the fauna. So let's say you've got your habitat. What, what do you do to make sure that the fauna is safe and happy as well? So one of the first elements, um, the most just so important in the Australian context is large old trees. If you have large old trees, do whatever you can to look after them and care for them because they are irreplaceable in in time, in our lifetime, because hollows form after 100, 200 years. And sure, we have nest boxes, but they don't offer the same amount of habitat as a large old tree. And the other thing about large old trees is it's not just about the hollows, it's also the other habitat features that they provide. A big old tree like this is a messmate where I live um, over uh, near Dalesford and Porcupine Ridge. This messmate, it's got big gnarled bark, which has lots and lots and lots of um, space for insects. You can get um, buff front thornbills, will like nest in the crevices in the bark. Um, huge branches. Um, when the branches are really big, um, it's been uh, recorded that koalas prefer sitting on larger branches, like they're more comfy. Um, you don't get that in a smaller tree. Um, also, a large old tree produces a lot of nectar. Um, it flowers longer and the nectar is better quality and then therefore the seeds are better quality as well. So these are features that you simply just don't find on young, uh, younger trees. Um, so if you're looking at um, a wildlife friendly garden, definitely large old trees are a really important element. And in fact, some bird species are only really found in the forests and gardens that still have these large old trees, things like tree creepers. Um, one of the things about having a garden for wildlife, whether it's a little garden or a bigger garden, is that you can learn how to be a bush detective. You don't actually necessarily have to see the animal. And here we have, and if I was doing this in a room, I'd be like, shout out, what, what kind of scat do you think this is? Um, does anyone want to shout out? Looks like possum poo to me. It does look like possum, but the difference, thanks, Pat, the difference between the possum poo and this poo is you'll note that all of the droppings are the same uh, shape. They're kind of oval and they're very uniform. And if you broke it open and then sniffed it, it's like pure eucalyptus. So these are actually koala scats. Oh. And then you can see the, um, the tracks on the tree where the koala climbs up like this. Um, so yeah, that's another sort of larger tree thing. So, something to aim for. But I know some people uh, in Ashbourne Land Care and they planted their um, some managums, uh, I think uh, 16, 15 years ago, and they've got koalas in them now, which is, uh, yeah, really, they'd love that. Okay, so nuts and bolts, creating habitat. What do you need? So there's so many different ways to create habitat, but in the garden setting where we're talking about your people's gardens, it's about shrubs. And I've said shrubs, 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 because shrubs are just so important. Uh, they provide food, they provide nesting sites, they provide protection from predators. Um, 
And that's really what a wildlife friendly garden is. It's like you need all the different elements so that the animals can go about their lives, that live their day to day, live their day to day, get the food and the protection that they need and be able to breed <clears throat> ideally and move through the landscape. So this picture here is of a, um, a, a local, well, local to Castlemaine wattle. I, I'm, you might get that some in the woodland uh, open areas um, in the north of the Macedon area. And uh, yeah, it's a, um, oh, I forget what it's called now. Um, anyway, it doesn't matter. But yeah, it's very prickly. Acacia paradoxa. Sorry, plant nerds either learn all the Latin or it's hard to remember the common names as well, I have to say. Yeah. So I've said here that native and in, uh, locally indigenous is definitely preferred. And that's one of the pr principles for gardening for wildlife. Having said that, though, perhaps you've bought a property that already has some plants there. Um, so... Uh, this is a picture of my place and uh, you can see uh, there's a lot of non-Indigenous plants in uh, the picture. In fact, nearly all of them are, but this is right near the house. So we've got the big roses that get um, chowed down by the rosellas. But uh, the um, there's that sort of, I think they're called pineapple sage. Um, the salvias are a really good um, plant because they don't spread into the surrounding uh, bushland areas and they provide nectar for eastern spinebills. Um, and the, the circle that I've done there is because, um, yeah, it, we've had, we've got um, um, fairy wrens, superb fairy wrens, also known as blue wrens, and they have bred on our property. I've been here 20 years. And it wasn't until two years ago when this photo was taken that I finally spotted where a nest was. And it's surprisingly quite low down um, where that circle was. And I only spotted it because of the young were fledging. So there was quite a commotion by the parents and it's quite exciting. Um, so yeah, it's a good, good example of cover. But uh, if you want to find out um, what kind of plants are suitable for your area, especially if you live in the Macedon Ranges, I would suggest um, our flora guides on plants and weeds. And I think Darren's going to be able to send you out some info on that. Uh, just another example, this is a uh, hakea uh, or bushy needlewood or silky needlewood. And I planted this, sometimes it's a long game. I planted that, I planted in 2011 and it wasn't until it was uh, maybe two years ago that it got to a certain height where um, the reason I planted it actually happened. And so it's a little hard to see, but you can see it's been crunched quite thoroughly. And a lot of the uh, hakea um, seed pods have been crushed and dropped. And that's because in, um, in my garden, which is um, open grassy dry forest, there's no hakea left, but I wanted to make sure the yellow-tailed black cockatoos could come and have a feed. So when I saw that the plant was like that, I was very happy. It meant that the, that it had happened. And now there's actually young hakeas uh, germinating underneath, which is fantastic. Um, so it's when you're thinking about creating habitat, funnily enough, um, a lot of birds and animals are just not that fussy. Uh, they'll actually uh, nest in some of the strangest places. And I'm sure many of you have stories of uh, birds nesting in sheds or uh, carports or even in old coats or perhaps boots. And uh, I've got this um, picture here because uh, this white-browed scrub wren, uh, we get them nesting here every year. And this, this one, um, <clears throat> one year, nested in a flower pot right next to our back door. And uh, I was uh, really uh, disturbed because I thought we would be disturbing it as we go in and out. So I actually turned the pot around so that the, the opening of the nest faced away, thinking that would be less disturbance for the bird. But then when I went and hid and then watched what happened, the bird couldn't find the opening to its nest. So I quickly put the pot back. And so I have a feeling that the birds are pretty smart. And I think 
think that they know that the Karawangs aren't going to come that close to our back door. This is just conjecture. And that they're nesting um, so close to humans, my, me and my husband and, and the dog, um, because of that safety from um, other birds. Um, so other kinds of fauna, um, there's also small fauna. Um, for example, little tiny insects such as this little tiny bees, um, blue banded bees, um, little flies. And so, um, yeah, it's important, um, yeah, to think about all different, not just vertebrates, not just birds and, and, and possums and things. And we've just launched a uh, guide to the insects of central Victoria, which is fantastic. Absolutely fantastic and uh, well worth checking out. We have a lot of hard copies, um, but it's also available on our website. And I've put a picture there of some beautiful uh, flowering plants. It's uh, showy podolepis, which is a fantastic um, wildflower. And there's a native bluebell and a yam daisy there and various um, other kinds of plants, peas and grasses. And this is the kind of understory that we're looking for in a wildlife friendly garden where you have a lot of different um, flowers and seeds and also the structure is different depending on what kind of plants are growing there. I've popped the uh, Upper Campaspe Land Care Network there because um, they've got other resources as well, like a, a really uh, fantastic guide, which is a plant selection for pollinating insects. And it just goes on and on and on with all these different plants of various um, uh, species that you can plant, particularly for the insect fauna. And then the, you have lots of insects in your garden, then you've got lots of food for birds and other animals that eat insects. Um, so it's not only about planting, it's also about what you leave alone in your habitat, um, in your garden for wildlife. Depends on the garden, of course, but if you are in a property that has a bit of leaf litter, it's uh, really important to leave it alone um, if you can, as much as you can. Um, this is a dog uh, I used to have, Leela, who's since passed on, but uh, this was her standing in the way um, as I'm photographing just this amazing amount of fungi that comes up out of the leaf litter. Leaf litter is also really important for um, moths and other insects um, because their life cycle is such that, um, you know, they might be a caterpillar when they're on the plant that you've planted as a food plant. Um, and then when they're an adult, they're flying around as a butterfly or a moth and they're eating nectar or, and all of that. But when they pupate in that stage, they actually pupate in the ground, in the leaf litter. And so it's an important part of the cycle really important. Now I know there are fire considerations, um, but it's all about zoning. So it depends on the size and shape of your garden, but uh, certainly if you have those areas that are a little bit further away from your house, if you don't pick up the leaf litter at all, it'll eventually rot down um, because of all the amazing action of these fungi um, and other creatures like um, millipedes and um, snails and uh, beetles. So the layers then of a wildlife friendly garden, uh, this is a great uh, graphic from uh, BirdLife Australia when they used to be called Birds Australia. Um, it just kind of gives you, it's, it's for birds, but it sort of shows that even in, a, in a, a small garden, you can have many different layers and habitat elements that will provide um, food and perching places and places for the animals to act out their behavior. Like, have you noticed some birds like to have a certain singing spot so that they're uh, perched somewhere where they're calling really loudly and then they fly back down. And so here you can see, um, you can see logs and shrubs and um, bird baths and things. And so there's many different layers. Um, so, uh, just to finish the bit about, I guess, the, the sort of planting and the structural elements of the Garden for Wildlife, 
Um, I'll just show this picture here. Um, so this is a local roadside. Um, you can see uh, that the roadside on my right has had its native vegetation completely removed. And uh, I believe this was for aesthetic reasons, but people will also do this for fire reasons. And um, you can sort of see the difference between uh, the bright green is the non-native grass and there's no leaf litter there and there's no shrubs. Um, so um, that's an area that is remarkably different in terms of the kind of wildlife that would be able to use that space. And so when you're thinking about a garden for wildlife, people are starting, whether you're giving advice uh, to other people's properties, if you've become a garden for wildlife participant, or um, whether you're, um, you've bought a property or you're just starting out, if you have lots of flora and fauna and natural features, then your plan is to ensure that your everyday activities retain these beautiful features. So if you're building something, you don't remove the large old trees. If you're cleaning up after a storm, you make sure you don't remove um, the leaf litter or destroy any of the small understory vegetation. If you've got a beautiful patch of orchids that comes up every spring, you don't put your water tank there. It's all about retaining those features. If you've got a garden that is more like you've bought a property and it's more like um, this, this flat green area that I've got pictured there, then your plan can be about the reintroduction of these features. So that would be planting, bringing in branches, bringing in rocks, bringing in that structure, making things, um, uh, I guess, get bringing back those layers that I had in, in the previous slide. So on to some other tips, um, bird baths. So bird baths are really um, fantastically important, especially in drought times and heat waves. Um, so I've got a few tips there. Have a, a, make sure you have a stick, um, plenty of cover, um, keeping them clean, um, different sizes. So um, this mosaic one is used by different species than the very thin one, uh, sorry, the very shallow one, because um, the, the, the deeper one, uh, the fairy wrens jump in and sort of swim through, um, whereas the shallow one, the, um, you get all the little thornbills on there um, bathing. And then out of picture, I've got a standing one, your more traditional shape, and that's the one used by the larger birds, such as parrots, and they sit in the middle and go and have a, a big old bath. Um, you've got to keep them clean. They really, fresh water is important. Even in winter, you'd be surprised how much they like to bathe um, <clears throat> in winter. And uh, don't have bird baths in reach of cats. Um, so I don't have any cats around me. Um, and that's why I've got bird baths on the ground. Speaking of cats, most of the people attending this seminar would probably be well aware of the problems that domestic and feral cats pose to wildlife. So I won't talk too much about it, but I just wanted to point you to this fantastic research Safe Cat, Safe Wildlife, um, it's at safecat.org.au and it has all these sorts of fantastic blog posts about people who've converted their outdoor cat to an indoor cat or how to talk to your neighbour. It's just really great. Um, there's another pet um, which people who know me know I'm pretty obsessed with. I really love dogs. And dogs are also, um, people say, oh, no, dogs are fine because they don't kill the wildlife the same as dogs do. But the problem is, is that dogs can cause a lot of stress. So um, the picture you can see in front of you. So we've got uh, an adorable wallaby that's taken out my back window. And it's got a baby, which you can't quite see in its pouch. Um, and then next to it is an aerial photo of where I live in all these bush blocks. Um, and I did a count one day and because like, let me see, this guy had two dogs, this guy had six dogs, I had two dogs, they had two dogs, they had two dogs, they had two dogs, 
they had three dogs, two dogs. Anyway, I counted and there were 22 dogs living just in this area at one point. And so this wallaby had to negotiate getting around. And so you think, oh, well, my dog just gives it a little bit of a chase. But that's that if you think of if you multiply that by 22 times, and that's a, a quite a lot of inter interruptions to the uh, feeding and daily lives of the animals that are sharing your space. Um, so I don't want to talk for too long because I don't want to hear I want to hear Pat, but I'll just keep going a little bit longer. A um, few other things. So sometimes people say, I've seen an old cockatoo, what should I do? So birds are either really uh, healthy or they're not well and they're dead. You know, they generally don't look old. Um, these birds here are suffering from beak and feather disease. And that's why we pretty much recommend don't feed. It's a controversial subject. If you're going to feed, you must keep it clean. So this bird here, beak and feather disease, um, this bird would be putting that bacteria into the, um, into the bowl and all surrounding it and spreading it to other birds. Mm. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, mince and bread, um, yeah, they can cause mineral um, and other deficiencies in animals. So, yeah, it's, um, it's a horrible disease. Their beaks and feet go long and deformed and uh, their feathers uh, drop out. And it can affect um, gang gang cockatoos as well. Um, Darren, do I have time to keep going or should I finish it up? Yeah, you've got a few more minutes. Okay, cool. Mine. All right. So my next slide, um, this is a bit of fun, really. Um, so this is an agile antichinus. This is about when you have a, a, a wildlife-friendly garden and they come in the house. This is an agile antichinus on our chopping block. But one of the questions that people have is like, how do I know whether it's a rat or an antichinus? And so tonight's hot tip is that you look at the droppings. So a rat uh, scat um, if you do this with it, it it won't. It's not friable. It just it's just it's just solid. Whereas because antichinus eat um, insects, um, when you do that to their scat, um, it just breaks up into tiny lots and lots of tiny little fragments. And you can see from the scat here that I photographed on our tablecloth, <laughs> um, it was uh, it's a bit shiny, and that's from the uh, insect. Um, insect fragments yeah so yeah it's it's all it's all uh it's it's a big world there's a lot more that i could be talking about in terms of uh how to um attract wildlife to your garden and then also how to look after it once it's there minimizing harm um and i'll probably be involved with the program in the future and give a talk um more on some of these habitat elements such as wildlife friendly fencing um, you know, lizard lounges and the like. So uh, if anyone wants to get in touch, you can um, get in touch with me um, by um, giving Darren a hoy. All right. I think I'll end it there, Darren. Thanks, everyone.